Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's forum. Welcome to those who are coming to us at home on Zoom. Today's forum is about planned giving, but before I introduce our guest speaker, let us pray. O oh, Almighty God, who has built the church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by the doctrine that we may be made one unified community. We ask this in the name of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Just a word of caution. Um, as you probably are aware, the COVID numbers are going up in the county, so it is highly recommended that you remain masked and perhaps a little socially distanced. And now I would like to introduce our guest speaker this morning, James Murphy, CFRE, Managing Program Director, who oversees ECF's financial resource programs, planned giving, donor solutions, including ECF's Donor Advised Fund Program, and its new online fundraising resource hub, ECF 360. Active in ecumenical collaborations, he works with congregations, dioceses, and other Episcopal organizations to enhance and develop their programs and resources. Jim is the author of Faithful Giving, The Heart of Planned Gifts, an interfaith book in press 2022. General editor and a contributing author for Faithful Investing, The Power of Decisive Action and Incremental Change, an ecumenical book on socially responsible investing, and a contributor to One Minute Stewardship and We Shall Be Changed, all from Church Publishing, Inc. Jim holds a certificate in fundraising from New York University's School of Continuing and Professional Studies, an MA in Christian Spirituality from General Theological Seminary, and a BS from NYU's Stern School of Business. Jim is a member of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Philanthropic Planning Group of Greater New York, and is a certified fundraising executive. Please give me Please join me in welcoming Jim Murphy. Well, Stacy, thank you so much for that introduction. My goodness, that's a long bio. I've got to, I've got to cut that down a bit. It's great to be with everyone today. Um, let me just do one quick tech check. That's not working yet. Is it in? Okay. Okay. Well, I might have to point to have the slides changed. Okay, well, great. Um, so it's wonderful to be here. I want to thank uh, Richard and your dean and all of the community of the cathedral, as well as St. Paul's Senior Services. And thank you, Todd Caprielian. And where is he? Craig Smith. I don't see him anymore. He's somewhere. And then we have uh, actually the president, I understand, Mike. Mikhail, is it? Too many Irish people in the room, you know, that may be a problem. <laughs> anyway, it's wonderful to be here and thank you all for coming. I know we have somewhat of a mixed crowd today. It is both uh, folks who just attend here at the cathedral as well as folks who are involved either on the board or a resident at St. Paul Senior Services. So it's just wonderful to be here. We have a very unique relationship with the cathedral as the Episcopal Church Foundation um, manages your endowment funds as well. And I've been here many times for a variety of reasons and it's really just great uh, to be here once again. Everyone should have this cheat sheet and this is really all you're getting from me for today. I'm happy to share slides eventually and give them to Richard and to Todd uh, and they can certainly be uh, used by you. So, let me just say one thing. What I am not, what I am not here to do today is to turn you all into planned giving experts. That is not the goal. The goal here is to help raise awareness of the many different kinds of planned gifts which you may consider 
uh, to make either to this wonderful cathedral, to St. Paul Senior Services, or to other charities, okay? So that's our goal for the day. We will have time for questions, but if you have a burning question that you must stop me for, that is just fine. Throw a shoe at me or whatever you wish. But I will, as I said yesterday, you won't hit me. I can still move pretty fast at 54 as the youngest of eight children, so. <laughs> Uh-oh, there's that ugly bald guy again. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get back the slideshow. Oh, okay, great. Let me see if I can change it. I can't, so I'm going to, when I do this, that is my, okay, so boom. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, very briefly, the Episcopal Church Foundation, for those of you who may not know us, we are the foundation for the entire Episcopal Church. We serve all of its dioceses, parishes, and related entities like St. Paul Senior Services. And we do uh, two main things, which are leadership resource development as well as financial resources for the various leaders of the Episcopal Church all throughout the country. We're an independent and lay-led organization, which is quite rare, honestly, in the Episcopal Church. We love our clergy brothers and sisters, but none of them are on our board. Um, but nonetheless, so we focus on empowering leaders, both lay and clergy, throughout the country. So you can do it twice. There you go, one more. Okay, fantastic, great. So what we're going to do today, and we're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time in any area, but I like to set context, right? So that people have a sense of what we're talking about today. So in context, we are talking about making a financial gift to a charity, right? Now there's different ways that someone can do this. Um, and the three main types of ways are giving as an ordinary gift, typically through your annual giving or your annual stewardship efforts at your congregation or through your charity. People normally make that kind of a gift from their current income. So what that means is that many of those gifts will go up and down over time based upon someone's personal financial situation, the economics of the area, etc., etc. Secondly, extraordinary giving or extraordinary giving, as we say in New Jersey, um, most often seen within the context of a capital campaign or a major gifts effort. This is where an institution would lay out a plan for building new facilities as the wonderful facilities are here at St. Paul's Cathedral and one would make a pledge and then pay that pledge off over the course of several years. Those are typically gifts from assets or excess income that someone may have in those particular years. What we're going to be talking about today are ultimate gifts or planned gifts or legacy gifts. They're all the same basic thing. These are gifts that people make out of their estate or out of assets they hold for retirement. And the word I want you to focus in on for this is the word future. Planned gifts are future-focused gifts. And I work, as I did yesterday, with uh, the Diocese of San Diego and all of its uh, folks who came to our workshop yesterday on helping them to understand how crucially important these planned gifts are to the individuals who give them, that they want these gifts to last for the future mission and ministry of an institution like St. Paul Senior Services or the Cathedral or other charities. They are so convicted about the, um, the future of your institution that they wish to actually raise you, one back, sorry, okay, to the level of family in their estate plans. And this is a basic description again about what planned gifts are. But the words that are most important are personal values, because that is what is crucial when it comes to planned giving. You as a donor believe in that future mission and ministry. You want to see it continue. You want to see others who have experienced like you the benefits of the cathedral and its many missions or all of the great work that St. Paul Senior Services would do 
you want to raise them to the same level that your children and grandchildren are. And you want to see their mission and ministry last long into the future. As I say, this is the central focus and what I talk about over and over and over again for those of you who were there yesterday just to ensure that leaders understand this because they are crucial gifts for the individual and coming from the heart. They're truly an emotional gift. So now, don't change the, nope, nope. <laughs> this is, and I'm like addicted to this, so I can't even let it go as you can see. But anyway, um, so before changing slides, before changing slides, I'm curious who here, who here can tell me where in our wonderful Book of Common Prayer is there the clearest direction for individuals to make a planned gift? And this is actually a requirement of clergy. Now, there are two people who were at the work, th at least three, at the workshop yesterday. So, um, does anybody remember? Now you can change it. Yes, it is page 445. <laughs> you are correct, ma'am. You are quite correct. Can you remember the context where this rubric, as we know in the old days, this used to be in red, rubric for red. Yes, sir? That's exactly right. Thanksgiving for the birth or adoption of a child. What, what is a more transformational time in one's life than becoming a parent? I'm not a parent. I'm the uncle of 17, but I am not a parent. I do understand, though, being as a, as a good uncle, now many times a great uncle, how important it is to focus in on what was important to you in your lifetime, being moved by the next generation coming along to desire to plan and ensure, ensure that your wishes are fulfilled. So these are all crucial, crucial things. And I like to point this out because this is a very wise decision that our prayer book framers have done at a very transformational time in life that you would put this up. Does anyone know by chance where this shows up in the 1928 Book of Common Prayer? So it is a bit awkward and I'm not, I am not putting down the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. I'm like the highest high churchman you've ever met so I really dig the 28 prayer book. But Father Richard, you know where it is, right? The ministration of the sick. Doesn't that seem a little awkward for the priest to go to Mrs. Smith and say, Mrs. Smith, you really don't look so well today. Have you remembered the cathedral in your estate plan? So a little awkward, a little bit awkward. However, we're going to focus for a few minutes uh, on all the different types of planned gifts and two principal things. The first thing I must always say when I'm in California, because I don't want anyone to get angry at me, is I know people in California hate the probate system. I get it, I know why, I understand all of that. And so when I'm talking will, I often have some folks, it's more in LA than down in San Diego, you guys are a bit more chill. But up in LA, I get people getting very angry at me if I use the word will because they say nobody in California has a will, everybody has a trust to hold their ass. Isn't that, that's just fine. I get it, I understand, I know. It's essentially the same set of tools, right? So, okay, so be with me on that. Um, the second item, just to draw your attention to, is you'll notice there's many different types of planned gifts. And that's really the lesson, more than remembering everything else I might blather on about today, is that there are many different types of gifts. What does that mean? That means that at different times of your life, Certain gifts would may be more appealing, more appropriate, and as circumstances change later in life, you might have to change your plans in your estate so that your ultimate wishes can be fulfilled. So just to put that out there and make sure everyone knows they should seek their own 
legal, tax, and financial advice before finalizing any gift. You should seek that professional advice when making your trust, when writing your will, when doing any of these elements because you want to ensure that your wishes are fulfilled and you do what is best for you and for your family. Okay. Okay, Ooh, awesome, you're on the right one. Did I, I clicked it and it went, so maybe you're just, you're just in sync with me now, thank you. Did it? Oh, oh awesome, okay, now I feel good. Now I feel in, in control, which is important for me. Okay, bequests. So, when I talk about bequests, I am being very inclusive. I always try to be very inclusive, but I'm being very inclusive for wills, trusts, and what are known as transfer on death instructions. What that is, and I know it's very popular here in California as it is throughout the country now. When you open up a new CD, a new bank account, a new brokerage account, you probably have on that application a line toward the bottom that says, on my death, this account may go directly to XYZ person, this charity, or whomever is designated and then all that person needs to do is to contact the entity, prove who they are and show proof of death and they can take over the account. So it's all of those things which I'm looping under in the area of bequest. So one thing to note is that that is the vast, vast majority of all of these types of gifts. So this is the majority of things you will be thinking about as a part of your estate plan. These gifts are all revocable, revocable, remember? <laughs> so that you can adjust those, you can adjust the amount, you can remove an individual or a charity from your plans, all based upon what is right for you and fulfilling your wishes, okay? So that's very important to remember. There's several different types of bequests. The first is a specific dollar amount where you say, I will leave $10,000 to St. Paul's Cathedral. That's a wonderful thing. That's a very common thing that people do. The challenge is, do know that if you have a number of different specific dollar bequests in your estate plans and you wanted to leave the rest of your estate to charity, uh, to either to charity or to individuals, to your children, whatever the case might be, just bear in mind that you never know for sure what your estate value will be when you pass away. It could be much higher or it could be much lower. Um, I know of someone who had designated 25 different specific dollar bequests in her estate plans. And the rest of her estate was gonna to go to her four children. The problem was, throughout her life, she never updated her estate after first writing her will. Back in Michigan, you know, back in the 40s or whenever it was. So what happened though, later in life, she had a number of health issues and she had to be in nursing home care for quite an extended period and all of her assets basically and the family home had to be liquidated to pay for that. So that when she passed away, she had a much smaller estate than she had anticipated because she had never updated her estate plans, which is a plug to always be watchful and mindful of updating your estate plans through the years. If you get married or divorced, if you have new grandchildren, if you move states, if you move states sometimes, your will in another state may not be valid. So all of those things just to keep in mind. But anyway, she had, her estate had to pay out all of those specific dollar bequests first before anything was left to her children. And as I joked yesterday about this, those kids will never give a penny to any of those charities that she cared so much about during her lifetime because they stole their inheritance away. So certainly not what she had originally intended, but again, just a prompt to remember to keep your estate plans up to date and consult professionals throughout the process. What may work well for most everyone are percentages where you would allocate a certain percentage of your estate to different family members, perhaps a percentage to charity, and as my friend Terry Parsons of blessed memory, who used to be the stewardship officer of the Episcopal Church said, 
if you could never find it in your heart, I can't do her accent from Kentucky, um, if you could never find it in your heart to tithe, give 10% while you are alive to the church, you ain't gonna miss it when you're dead. So just another thought to keep in mind. And that also works well depending on whether you have a large or a small estate. You can still show that conviction you have for charity and for your preferences during your lifetime. Specific assets is another option. If you desire to leave specific assets, family heirlooms and such, I strongly, strongly urge you to reach out to the leadership uh, at the charity, either the cathedral here or to Todd and Craig at St. Paul's, because they may not be able to accept particular assets like jewelry, like artwork, or for that matter, real estate. I'll come back to real estate a little bit later. Finally, well, almost finally, is remainder. So uh, that is where you allocate all of the rest of your assets in the state and you say then the remainder may go to an individual or to charity or whatever. On the whole, for most charities, receiving a remainder value is the largest gift that they receive. Now that can be intentional or unintentional. It can be intentional if someone really wanted to leave the bulk of their estate can be unintentional if they did not plan well, if they neglected to anticipate other inheritances they might have received late in life. So again, it's just important to be cognizant and make plans and adapt them over time. Contingency is you would give this asset, this percentage, whatever it is, if this happens, right? Typically people use it if their spouse predeceases them, or if God forbid their children predecease them, then whatever they're allocating in their estate will go to a charity or to another individual or whatever is appropriate for them. I find these very, very important uh, when including charity f uh, when someone is younger because perhaps they have other things that they need to be concerned about, other children, other family members, and perhaps they make charity a contingent beneficiary. And that can be very appropriate for a lot of people. Okay, lastly on this are bequest designations. So who here uh, serves on the board of St. Paul's Senior Services or has been on the vestry here at St. Paul's Cathedral or somewhere else? Well, dear board and vestry people, which would you rather receive as a gift? Unrestricted, right? That is what most boards would desire. Most vestries, and well, chapter, I'm sorry, I'm at the cathedral. So most chapters at a cathedral would like. And why is that? Because they typically are the best informed about what's happening and what needs are current for the institution and they can make good decisions with those unrestricted gifts in a variety of ways. However, it is a norm for many people to desire to restrict their gift in some way, shape, or form. And so, if you as a donor are considering making a restriction on the gift you give, it could be for a number of reasons, perhaps you maybe are unsure about leadership in the future, you don't know what's going to change, maybe you have a great devotion to music or outreach or something like that. If you desire to restrict your planned gift in the future, please once again reach out to the leadership of the charity and talk to them about it because there may be a way for them to talk you through another option where it would be less restricted because what you want to avoid is what's known as an anachronistic restriction. Back in my home state of Michigan, there was an endowment uh, made by a wealthy industrialist back in the 19th century to give coal, the mineral, coal to the poor at Christmas time. Now that's a wonderful thing if you still heated your home with coal. However, you would have to go to court to have something like that reversed so that you could use it in the modern age. So you want to avoid those. You want to give as much freedom as possible to the board, to the chapter or vestry so that they can make good decisions with those gifts. Okay, and everything that I've just said about the different types of requests will apply to the ultimate value of the other gifts that I'm now going to touch on. And I will just um, make sure that everybody 
but he still has this cheat sheet. You can follow along in the next section on life income gifts. That is the cover of that sheet, the top of that sheet. And I will also forewarn you, this is the most detailed couple of minutes of the presentation. If it is utterly sleep inducing to you, that's okay. You may take a nap and wake up in a couple of minutes, but then you have to promise me that you will keep this at your bedside next to your Anglican rosary or your prayer book or your daily office book, whatever you may use. And in addition to that, um, repeat the different aspects of the different gifts to yourself, imitating my New Jersey, Michigan accent, and lull yourself to sleep at night because subliminally you'll be educated about all the different types of plant gifts. Okay, so life income gifts, what are these? These are cases where an individual really believes in your future mission and ministry and they wish to make a gift, but they cannot give away an asset without receiving in exchange a flow of income to them or to another individual, okay? The three types I'm going to touch upon all follow the same basic pattern, which is the donor makes an irrevocable gift. They can never get that gift back. It is a completed gift. In exchange for that, though, they receive a charitable deduction in the year they make the gift, and either the donor or whomever the donor designates receives a flow of income, typically for the rest of their lives. When the person receiving that income passes away, so it could be the donor, it could be somebody the donor has designated, when that person receiving the income passes away, the remainder of that gift is liquidated and paid out to the various Episcopal and other charities that have been designated, okay? So all of these follow that same basic pattern. And as I say, you might find that this is a gift that might work well for you. Everyone here looks under 40, so I'm sure that this will not be a real popular gift for another few years, but if you are retired, especially if you're over 70, these kind of gifts may be very useful to you in your retirement. Okay, so the first brief one we're going to talk about is known as a pooled income fund. These are not as popular as they once were. The way it works is after you make that um, irrevocable gift, your gift is pooled with other gifts of the same kind. And everyone participating in the pool receives a pro rata share of the income, the yield, the interest and dividends that those assets produce. So it does not, does not dig into the principle of the gift. So this gift works really well for people who don't mind having some variable income and their main goal is to leave a significant gift to the charity at their death. This will typically leave the almost the entire original gift to the charity. As I say, it's not as popular. What is popular, and what I know several people in the room today actually have a charitable gift annuity uh, through St. Paul Senior Services, the most popular life income gift is a charitable gift annuity, or CGA. This works a bit differently, and I have a couple of examples to show you, but the way this works is after you make that irrevocable gift, your gift is pooled. If you are a resident of California, you get pooled in the California pool, which is highly restrictive. I could go into a couple of hours of discussion about that, but I won't. Um, but the way it works is that after you have made that irrevocable gift, you will receive a fixed amount of income for the rest of your life. That amount of income is based upon your age and the annuity rate that is assigned to your age multiplied by the amount of your gift. And that's how you get a fixed amount that you get paid for sure for the rest of your life. The nature of this gift though is it does dig into the principle of the gift. That is its nature so that on average about 50% of the original gift will be left for the charities at the end of the income recipient's life. Okay, a very useful tool and that's how it's able to pay out a larger amount over time. Um, now, a quick 
comment, the individual receiving income, because this is an annuity contract with the Episcopal Church Foundation, who's the sponsoring charity, even if your gift goes down to zero, because let's say that the markets are suffering or you live far, far beyond your life expectancy, and it goes down to a zero value, which nothing will go to the charity, you will still receive that income. So it works just like a normal annuity, but the income comes then from the sponsoring charity, in this case, the Episcopal Church Foundation. Okay, and because of that, 10% um, of the remainder of whatever remains with these gifts comes back to the Episcopal Church Foundation as a tithe to support the ongoing planned giving efforts of the Episcopal Church throughout the country. Okay, one quick note, charitable gift annuity rates, thank goodness, are going up as of July 1st. So it's actually a, quite a substantial increase and these are a couple of quick examples of what that is. In this case, Miss Smith, and it is quite often Miss Smith, if we don't know this already, women are much more generous than men. And if you don't believe that women really funded the building of the church, please just read the Acts of the Apostles. It's quite obvious. Thank you, women, for being so generous. But in this case, Miss Smith had $100,000, let's say, in a CD. She creates a charitable gift annuity with that. She receives a tax deduction of $48,000. Now, why did she not get the whole $100,000? Because the nature of this gift is it's only going to leave about 50% to charity. So that is the present value of the anticipated remainder. Okay, so that makes sense. That's why the tax deduction is where it is. Then, in her case, she gets a 6% annuity for her age, and she'll receive that until she dies. And up to the age of her life expectancy, because she used cash, it will actually be primarily a tax-free income for those years. So very advantageous for some people when they are retired. And again, about 50% will be left for charities when the person dies. It could be higher, it could be lower. When it is for two people, and this is often the case where a married couple will make a gift like this, Okay, now it's, there we go. <laughs> I don't know, I'm touching it and it's not doing it. All right, so for a married couple, the rates are lower because you're dealing with two lives rather than just one, the income tax deduction, but still about 50% of the original gift will be remaining for the charity at the death of both people. So very useful tool. The last one, and then that's, that's it for the most complex gifts, I promise. Um, oh, there we go, okay. So the next one is the Charitable Remainder Trust. In very brief terms, the first two gifts, the Pooled Income Fund Charitable Gift Annuity, are very simple, if you will. Um, this is a more complex gift. So this gift creates its own charitable entity and the Episcopal Church Foundation for free can work with the donor and the donor's attorney to set up this trust and then ECF as an institution continues on as permanent trustee for this trust. So very useful tool for some people. It is able to give um, its ultimate value to non-Episcopal entities as well as Episcopal, which is a little different. The first two, the pooled income and the CGA, are only to go to Episcopal entities. You can fund this with a variety of assets as well, like real estate and other things. So a very useful tool. But the one thing I wanted to point out before wrapping this up with this is that the Episcopal Church Foundation drafts up that initial trust document for the donor and the donor's attorney to review. That ends up being really important because the vast majority of attorneys nowadays are not trust and estate experts. They are in other things and that's because of the thresholds for federal taxation on estates has gone so incredibly high. There really isn't much work for them to do these days. And so we do that um, nearly perfected trust document for the donor and the donor's attorney to review and they're very appreciative of it. The last point with all three of these gifts is that ECF, as the main resource for planned giving in the Episcopal Church, 
we have the entire back office to handle everything with these gifts so that all one needs to do if this sounds interesting is simply give us a call and we have all of our contact information on uh, the various things that have been handed out I have my cards and such up here as well but um, don't feel overwhelmed. I know these are a little more complex, but it's important to hear about them because if I don't talk about them, people won't know. So, and I'm very happy to say, as I said before, there are people here who already have a charitable gift annuity. Okay. Maybe. There we go. Okay. So, as we begin to wrap up the different types of plant gifts for you to be considering, retirement accounts. So I'm going to get a little deeper about a, a separate topic on this, but I, I presume some of the people in this room have heard of this thing called a pension. Does anyone know what a pension is? Well, I, I think the clergy still gets a pension, but I don't. So people my age and younger typically have all of their retirement assets in these tax-deferred accounts, right? That you have monies taken out before they are taxed, and God willing, uh, you know, the market cooperates and they grow over time so that when you retire, that's when you pay the ordinary income tax on what you're taking out. So I'm going to address a separate thing with a traditional IRA, but for all three of the basic types from IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, all of those types of tax deferred accounts, it is possible for you to leave the remainder balance of that account which would go to charities directly without the charities paying any of the deferred taxes. It's an incredible gift to a charity that you believe in and want to see it last into the future. Um, when you leave the balance of those uh, various accounts to other people, and I'm not going to get into all of the particulars of this, but when it goes beyond your spouse and to other people, it's heavily taxed. So it can be a, a challenge in the present, but if you leave the remainder balance of any of those tax deferred accounts to charity, they receive it um, fully and can fund their future mission and ministry with it. Life insurance, that actually can be a planned gift too. You can designate the cathedral or St. Paul's senior services on practically any form of life insurance, term insurance, whole life, etc. There are even more complex ways to use insurance and if you want to know more about that and how you could make the charity the owner and beneficiary of that, please just contact me. I'm happy to share a variety of information for you to consider with your professional and insurance advisors. Real estate. So, real estate always seems like a great gift, right? The challenge often is for most charities that do take real estate, is it can be the gift that keeps on taking for the charity, unfortunately. And it may be well-intentioned when, when originally planned, but many times those pieces of real estate that are given to charity may require extensive refurbishment, paying of various fees and whatnot. And so if you are considering leaving your home or another piece of real estate to a charity like the cathedral or like St. Paul Senior Services, please reach out to the leadership and talk to them about it. They may not be able to accept real estate. Um, and perhaps there's another way that works better for you and for your family on designating that. Okay. So I'm going to pause there for a second just in case there are questions because I still can't change the screen. There we go. We're going to talk a little bit in closing about what I keep calling these days planned giving adjacent because so many uh, questions often come up. But any questions at the moment? Yes, sir. Yep. Yes. 
So you would receive the tax deduction just like you would receive any other tax deduction. And so, as you are pointing to, I think, more and more people don't itemize their deductions anymore because of the changes in the tax law. And that is true. However, there may be certain years where you make the choice to itemize deductions. Maybe you have a higher income, some other thing occurs during that year, and it would be useful from a practical point of view to do it. Many people create them and they may use the full tax deduction in that year or they may spread it out over several years. It's all up to the individual and their context and what's right for them. ECF, as you see with the um, this cheat sheet, we have all those values very low because our goal is to allow anyone who would like to uh, do that to have the ability. Many people like to try it out and just see if they like how it works and then make a larger one later. That's perfectly fine. And again, not to overemphasize all of these details because what all of this comes back to is that you have a conviction, a heartfelt conviction for the future mission and ministry for this cathedral and the wonderful ministries it does or all of the great work that St. Paul's Senior Services does or any number of charities that you might specify. So I never want to pollute, if you will, with the details. <laughs> it's important to know because who the heck else is going to tell you all this except me? Maybe somebody. Maybe Craig Smith. Maybe. We're training him up on this. So anyway, a few quick notes about what I'm starting to call planned giving adjacent. Those things that sort of cross over. And I've mentioned a couple of them already um, with the tax deferred accounts. But I want to talk specifically about, it worked again, yeah, it's, it's Murphy's Law, as we know. Anyway, uh, so this one for giving through an IRA. So to be very, very clear, because this is very important, there are three types of tax deferred accounts. 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, and all their excessive variety. So you have the ability through a traditional IRA, a traditional IRA, which is what many people create after leaving a company and they convert their 401k or 403b into a traditional IRA. Many people do that, not everyone. But if you do have a traditional IRA, the government actually allows you to do some special things. And some of you may already know about this. I'd love to hear it if you are doing it. So if you have a traditional IRA and you are over 70 and a half, you can actually make a direct gift to charities that you support using that account in what's known as a qualified charitable distribution. So it goes directly out of your account to charity. Now the extra benefit for this is once you have a required minimum distribution after you are age 72, this qualified charitable distribution can actually count toward that required minimum distribution. So it's a wonderful opportunity for you to support the charities that you love and uh, wish to see continue into the future with a present donation. This is, though, uh, something that is important to more and more of older baby boomers, of whom I am friend. I'm not a baby boomer, I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, let's just be clear about that. But um, so those older baby boomers, perhaps who did have a pension and did have other assets accumulating, didn't have most of their assets in some of these accounts. And when they have a traditional IRA, it's actually a burden to them to take that withdrawal. They don't want their taxes to be, I'm sorry, they don't want their income to be increased because it could impact Medicare designations and the level that you pay, all of those things. So many times, the charity can be the hero for many of these folks because they could make that required minimum distribution effectively through a qualified charitable distribution to the charity. And then don't forget that you can actually designate your charity of choice as 
uh, the entity that will receive the rest of your IRA at death. Okay. Lastly, donor advised funds. For the same reasons that we were just talking about with the changes in tax laws where fewer people itemize their deductions every year. There are some years that someone might want to, right, for whatever reason that might be. And in those years, they may wish to receive a larger tax deduction. What they can do, and this is incented by the new tax laws, is they can bunch or batch their donations together all in one year so they're able to get that larger deduction in that year. And a great vehicle for doing this, and I have some brochures up here from the Episcopal Church Foundation for it, are the donor advised fund. The way that works, if you don't know what that is, it's basically a charitable checking account for you where you can make um, a significant or subsequent donations to that and each time you make a donation you get that charitable deduction and then you advise the sponsoring charity whether that's the Episcopal Church Foundation, Fidelity Charitable or Charles Schwab or anybody like that um, to make grants to charities that you support. Okay, so it could be any type of charity, your retirement home, your congregation, or whatever it might be. That works well for a lot of people, and honestly, a lot of younger people like this vehicle too because it's all online. It's all easily done. <laughs> you make one donation and then just go online to make all of your grants. So the last bit on this though, as a planned giving adjacent opportunity, is when you create a donor advised fund, you can actually designate a subsequent advisor so that after your death, your child could continue your philanthropy after you've passed away and continue to give to the various charities that you were giving to. The other option would be just to say ultimately when you pass away to pay out all of the balance to one or more charities as you wish. So it's a useful, useful tool. So would love to take some more questions, but what I want to just close on to make sure that it is clear, this is a lot of detail. But in the end, what's most important for you as an individual, for you as a couple, for you as a family, is to reflect on what has been most important to you in your lifetime. What has moved your heart and inspired you to be philanthropic and to raise institutions to the same level that your children or grandchildren will be. Those charities, whether it be your congregation or other charities like St. Paul Senior Services, are wonderful opportunities for you to continue on and continue your philanthropy even after you've passed away and still have that great impact that you were seeking to have. So, would love to take um, more questions, if there are any. So that either means I did a real good job or a real bad job, we'll see. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Pat. Yes. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> So, so here's the, the thing is, is you should seek your own legal tax and financial advice, right? And um, when you go to a financial planner, some may be more knowledgeable than others. You can actually always take your cheat sheet with you and ask questions about what's appropriate. I actually had a conversation with a woman here in San Diego a few years ago. She was a very wealthy woman. And she told me the story of her financial advisor was advising her not, not to take money out of the assets he oversaw and create a charitable gift annuity or some other uh, useful tool that would eventually benefit charity. And when I talked to her openly about, well privately and openly about it, was that her advisor wanted to keep the assets under his control. So, and 
perhaps there is an incentive for many to do that. So the advice I would give is yes, seek the help of a financial advisor and review that, um, but be clear about what is important to you. What have been the charities that have mattered to you? And there are always ways to figure out how you can support those charities, either with lifetime gifts directly or through a planned gift in the future. And you should always seek the assistance of a qualified attorney. There is a lot of neat online stuff coming out right now, which maybe one day will be much more common, like free will and other entities like that for writing wills. But uh, ECF's official position is you should uh, seek out official legal guidance on creating uh, your estate documents so that your wishes are fulfilled. In the case of the life income gifts, those three that I was uh, you know, giving you all those details on, those are unique in that you need a sponsoring charity for those and for the donor advised fund. So for any interest in those, you can just contact us at ECF and my staff is trained on how to go through that and ensure that your privacy is upheld as well as you go through a process to figure out what gift is appropriate for you because in the end it may not be an appropriate gift. I've actually had to tell some people you should not make a charitable gift annuity <laughs> and that's a big thing of what we do but it's important because I need to put the donor's interest first always and that's the advantage also of working with an entity, a religious entity like ECF. We always put the donor's interest first when considering that. Uh, in the case that I'm thinking of, the woman was so committed to her church, she literally wanted to give her entire remaining life savings to a charitable gift annuity so that she could get the income and then, you know, ultimately go to the church. And after speaking with her about just in a very short time, it was clear she was giving practically all of her assets. And I said, you should not proceed. Do not do this. You need to hold on to these assets in case you need them. Very, very important. So. It, the vast majority of times you make a planned gift, as I said before, through revocable estate documents, your trust here in California, your will or other transfer on death options. Um, and you should only do those immediate gifts that are truly completed gifts if you have the assets that are appropriate. And we're certainly happy to chat with you about that. We will also recommend you seek your own legal and tax advice before finalizing, but we can certainly help you with all of those different life income gifts and the donor advised fund. Lots of technical interest, I love it. <laughs> Any other questions before we close? Well. I think that is really it. I got right on time, which I'm impressed with myself. I only went over two minutes yesterday. But anyway, I will, uh, I guess, put the floor to you. Is that appropriate? Great. Well, thank you all so much. This was a wonderful time. And I also thank the Diocese of San Diego, which works with ECF on its endowment as well, as in addition to the Cathedral and St. Paul's Senior Services. I sort of was a little, was I, was I pushy? I don't think I was pushy. So there was an opportunity to do this event, and I said, you know, Richard, I've been talking to folks out in San Diego anyway, and I'm sure they'd love to see me in person because I'm such a shining example of something. But um, so we were able to pull this all together, and wonderful that we have the sponsorships we do. And thanks again, because I forgot to say it, thank you, St. Paul Senior Services, for the food. So thank you very much for that. It's great to be with everybody else, and now I'll stop talking. Let's give another round of applause for Jim. Thank you so much for being with us in the forum today. Um, there will be no forum next week on July the 3rd. We will reconvene on July the 10th when Reverend Canon Allison Thomas will be here. Have a great Sunday, everyone.